Welcome to today's lecture on deep learning. So we're going to start by looking at supervised learning. Supervised learning is the most common paradigm in machine learning and deep learning. So whenever we're doing machine learning, we're learning from examples. And the examples in supervised learning come in the form of a data set that consists of n data points. And these data points are actually pairs of input vectors, xi, and output values, yi. And there are n of them. And in terms of notation, you will see that we use this calligraphic letter D to denote the data set. So calligraphic letters are sets. And typically, as I already said, X um, is a vector. So it's multivar multivariate in the sense that it consists of number D of features for each data point, so for each observation. And features could really be anything. It could be the age of a person, it could be the sex of this person, if an observation is a person, obviously. Or if the observation is an image, it could be the image pixel values. So three values, R, G, B, for each pixel. So that would be a very high dimensional feature vector if you think about taking all the pixels in an image and stacking them into a vector. And the label is mostly univariate. So it's a single label, which could either be um, categorical, such as a class label or the disease status, or it could be numeric, such as a price or a height, or something th like that. In terms of notation, a quick detour, we already touched on this. We used these italic letters as for scalars. We used lowercase bold letters for vectors, which is basically a vector of scalar values. Uh, we haven't seen yet a matrix, uh, but we will touch on that soon. That, so that is uppercase bold. And of course, we, uh, if we have vectors or matrices, we also want to get access to the entries. Um, and we do that using indexing. So we basically either talk uh, about the scalar values uh, in these vectors. Um, and then we use this italic notation. So xi would be I, the ith scalar in this vector or xij would be the element in the ith row and jth column of this matrix. Or we could also alternatively um, use square brackets to denote the same thing. So given this data set in machine learning, what we really want to do is we want to make a prediction. So say we're given a new data point x star and this x star lies here. The question is what can we say about the output value? So the, we are only given an input. What is going on with the output? Now the only thing that we're given is the X and the Y values of our training data. In order to say anything about the output of our new input value, X star, we have to make some assumptions. For example, in if um, we assume that all our data lie on a parabola, 
we may say, well, y star is probably here. Or if we say that all our data lies on a straight line, we may want to say that y star lies here. So we already see that we need to make some assumptions and these assumptions we encode in a so-called model, a machine learning model. And this model typically depends on some parameters that are contained in this vector theta. For example, if we said that we believe that our data is described by a linear function, f, then f depends on this parameter vector theta here, which has two elements. It has w and b, where b would be the abscissa and w tell us something. So w for weight and b for bias. It tells us something about if we move one to the right in x space, then we assume that we would move up by w. So it's a slope in this model. To repeat this, what we're given in supervised learning is a set of training inputs and training labels or outputs. And we use these in supervised learning to find a model and um, its parameter values such that for any inputs that we're interested in, we can say something about its outputs. There are really two major concepts of um, supervised learning, and those are classification and regression. In classification, our data is typically categorical. For example, here we have two classes. Um, we have our circles and our crosses. For example, these may be healthy, and these may be sick individuals. And say we observe a new data point x star here, then we would say that this person is probably healthy. So in classification, we basically find functions that try to discriminate between the um, different classes. Whereas in regression, we predict continuous values. So we don't have a number of discrete classes, but rather our outputs lie on a continuous axis. So here we have our inputs and here we have our outputs. Please note that in the left plot, we actually assume that both axes are input dimensions whereas our output dimension is not actually graphed in terms of the di dimension of this label, but in the form of these um, circles and crosses. In principle, we can actually do this iteratively. Say we have designed our model, which encodes our assumptions on the data. We get a training data set. We use the training data set to adjust the model parameters. Then we could basically go and see whether this model is good enough. If it is good, good enough, then we're done. 
However, if it isn't, we can go back and request more data and use it to update the model and so on and so forth, right? Until we think it is good enough. But how do we um, <coughs> how do we say whether a model is good enough? Well, we do so by defining an objective function. And we really need an objective function in order to optimize our parameters. So basically the objective function is a way to score different models. So given two parameters or two models, the our object, our objective function can tell us which one is better or worse. Typically in machine learning, we want to minimize an obje objective function. So the objective function would be a loss, but this um, could also be turned around. We could also maximize an objective function. So where a better model would sc score higher. So this is just, we now agree to think about objective functions as losses. And once we have such a loss, what we need is an optimization algorithm that finds the best parameter for our model based on the training data. So it basically ev iteratively evaluates the loss on the training data and gives us the best parameter values that it's found. So say, um, this is our parameter theta here. And if we plot the loss, then, and if this here is our theta zero that we get at the initialization, then the optimization algorithm would basically try to try out different um, theta values until it finds the one that minimizes the loss and that would be our theta optimum and our answer. Please note that we are optimizing only based on training data. So what we get back is the error or the loss that uh, on the data that the model was trained on. However, if we are interested in predicting unseen values that do not come with a predefined label, what we're really interested in is evaluating the test error. So that is the error on data that has not been used to train the model. And this can really s deviate significantly from the training error. And one reason is also that we used optimization to find the best parameter values for our training data set. However, we have not optimized on the test data set. So that means if we actually look at test data, we may get a worse error. And this difference between training and test error so if we, this is the loss and say, this is our training error and this is the test error. And this difference is due to overfitting. To the training data. In regression, there are several losses. One, for example, would be the L1 loss. So the L1 loss measures the absolute difference between our predicted values and our training labels. And if you want to graph the L1 loss, then 
So we'll say we plot here yi minus fi, then what we get back is a graph like this. So at zero, this is zero, and if so, this is basically the point yi equals fi and here they go um, they start to differ so if uh, fi is too high we get a positive loss and if uh, fi is too low because we're taking the absolute value we also get a positive loss another common loss is the squared loss or l2 loss and you may already um, guess that this loss looks like a parabola. So again, this is yi minus fi, and this is the loss. Then this L2 loss looks like a parabola. And Please note, if you compare it to the L1 loss, then between 0 and 1 and 0 and minus 1, the L1 loss is larger than the L2 loss, and then it becomes smaller. So the L2 loss would allow for many small deviation because it would... Um, get very small values here versus the L1 loss would try to actually um, avoid even small deviations and go to zero. However, if we look at large deviations between Fi and Yi, then the L1 loss is actually lower. That means that it is willing to accept large deviations for example, because you may have erroneous, or assume that you have erroneous labels in your data. So outliers is what we would call them. Um, however, it would try to avoid small errors and would rather try to get a perfect fit to the data if it can. Versus the L2 loss, that doesn't allow for very large deviation because it grows quadratically. Um, and as a result, it's actually also more prone to um, outliers. So if you actually have outliers in your data, then the, your model parameters will change a lot due to these outlier values because your model will be forced to fit them versus with an L1 loss, you may actually um, accept a few outlier uh, values and not change your parameters too much. For classification, there are different, loss, uh, different losses. Say you have a classification model that for each class predicts the probability of these classes. Then um, a good scoring function would be so if we go away from the loss, but actually look at um, better is higher is better, then the likelihood of observing your training labels may actually be a good scoring function. Equivalently, the log of this likelihood, right? So if the likelihood is high, then the log likelihood will also be high. So the log doesn't change the order of um, the, the values. But we said that we want to get a loss. So in order to take this function that, uh, you know, basically a model that assigns high log likelihood to your training data is good. Well, basically if we negate then, then a model that assigns a small negative log likelihood to your data is good. 
So the negative log likelihood of the labels, um, of the class labels, could be such a loss function. And this is actually the most frequently used loss function in deep learning for classification cases, where it's called the cross entropy loss. But I don't want to go too, de uh, too much into detail right now um, in these uh, probabilistic things. We will touch on th that later, at a later point in this lecture. However, um, I want to highlight that also when choosing the loss function, you are actually encoding a lot of the assumptions on your data. And loss functions also depend very much on the application. Say, for example, you are building a model that takes images of mushrooms and classifies them um, as what mushrooms they are. Say you have a, your model outputs that the probability that this image is a death cap is 0.2, which means that the probability that it's not a death cap given image equals one minus 0.2 equals 0.8. So it's most likely not a death cap, which means um, it is probably something else. Does that mean I should eat this uh, mushroom? Well, say eating a mushroom um, would kill you or eating a death cap would kill you then even if your model is 80% certain that this is not a death cap, then it is probably still not a good idea to eat this uh, mushroom because it is actually in 20% of the cases, or it thinks that in 20% of the cases, this image would correspond to a death cap. And actually this image is a death cap. Now with this, I want to close uh, this session and quite quickly to summarize and repeat, we discussed the basic concepts of supervised learning and the main ingredients are labeled training data. So basically inputs and outputs, a model that is parameterized and this model enc encodes our assumptions on the data. We need an objective function. So it's a function that allows us to take two different parameter values or two different models and compare them. And if you remember in machine learning, or we agree on here that we typically minimize a loss function where negative smaller values are better. So basically we want to find the model that achieves the smallest loss. And now that we have a parameterized model or training data, we also need an algorithm that takes the, this uh, objective function and optimizes to find the best parameter values and returns them to us. And with this, I want to th say thank you for listening and We'll see you in the next video.